Well, over the past four weeks, we've been walking through the mission and values of FCC, and we're almost done. So if you're like really bored of this series, just got one more week, and like we return to normal broadcasting schedule. But um, if you liked it, I hope that it's been helpful to you to help us understand where we are as a church family and where we're going. And so um, if you haven't been here, if you're a guest, you know, you're kind of in the tail end of things. But the nice thing is by coming at the last one, you get to kind of see the whole picture together uh, in your, there is an insert, kind of an outline of what we've been doing, going through, and most of that is on the left-hand side, and we'll be covering more on the right-hand side this morning. But um, we want to read that mission statement together, if you don't mind. Would you read that with me so we can start off this morning making sure you're awake and alert? It says, we exist to make disciples of Jesus by being the family of God sent into the world on a daily basis. And so we've been walking through the relationships of a healthy disciple, and we've used kind of the triangle as an illustration, and these relationships are really essential for a growing, thriving disciple. None of them can be totally neglected. And all of us are probably strong, stronger at least, in one of the three, and maybe a lot weaker in one of the three, and so that might be something to be thinking about this morning. Uh, the first relationship is the up relationship on your triangle there. That's, that's, uh, that's how we're seeking to grow closer to God, grow more in our relationship for our, our love for God, and how do we do that? And again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are just four statements that we want to characterize our love for God as a community and as individuals. What are they? Number one, reorient our lives around Jesus and the gospel. Number two, submit to God's word. Number three, rely on God through prayer. And number four, gather to worship Christ weekly. And then there's also an in relationship we've been talking about that we're called to grow in our love for the family of God, the church. How does that look? Well, here are the four statements that we've used to characterize this love for our church family. We ought to be growing in these four areas. Number one, commit to the hard work, right? We called it messy commit to the messiness of authentic biblical community. Number two, love others above yourselves. Love others above ourselves. Number three, contribute to the church family, not just consume. So what we do as a church isn't like a religious product that you're just receiving, but you're participating in it and helping it to grow. And number four, exhort one another to love and good deeds. And then finally we got last week, we finally got to this last relationship, and that is with our neighbor and ultimately the whole world. It's just not enough for us to, to have a cozy relationship with God and our brothers and sisters in our holy huddle. God calls us to be a family of missionary servants. And that's symbolized in the triangle by our out relationships uh, with, with our neighbors and really with the whole world and how we're going to bless the whole world. So last week we specifically began talking about sharing the gospel in deed and in word, that we have to learn to serve others, to show good deeds, that the power of the gospel is transforming us individually into vessels of loving kindness. And once we have established, you know, some life change and have learned to love people where they are, then we're also called to proclaim the truths of the gospel. It's always easier to declare the truths of the gospel when they are being displayed in our lives. And so today I want to finish the last three value statements, which, which really won't take me too long, and also come back right around and really hit on this whole area a little more specifically, or more generally, I should say, of, of loving our neighbor, blessing the world. So the next value is that we view each person as an image bearer of God. In other words... We can only show love for others. We can only show love for those that we don't know that well when we understand their spiritual condition and their identity as an image bearer of God. Genesis 1 is pretty clear about this, that God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. And so from the very beginning of creation, all of God's human creatures were considered image bearers of God, that there's something different about you and me and about all people that distinguishes us from the rest of animals and all of creation, including the angels. 
that we were made with this capacity to love and to create and really also to choose to reject God's rule in our lives. And, and Adam and Eve did just that. And while they and all of humanity have, have faced the consequences of that rejection since then, nevertheless, we're still bearers of God's image. We're, we're, we're born sinners, and we need Jesus, the Redeemer, and we have this common grace from God with the potential to choose God's rule for our lives. Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so our love has to extend beyond our own church family into the world around us because everyone around us is an image bearer of God just like us, no different. And so this value is establishing for us a realization that we need to treat every single person regardless of, you know, any kind of human category we could come up with, whether it's color or gender or, you know, orientation or religion or financial status or whatever it might be, that we treat every single person because they're an image bearer of God with respect and dignity and love. In other words, every person is worthy of us sharing the gospel in deed and in word. And because of that, our next value is to seek to bless others every day. That God has blessed us to be a blessing. That even before we think about how we can share the gospel in deed and in word, we need to be growing in this habit of simply blessing those around us. Now, what do, what do I mean by blessing others? Well, it's simply put, we're just seeking ways, like in our regular rhythms of everyday life, to just serve others and encourage others and give you know, gifts to them when that's appropriate. And so this means for me you know, that I, I, I wave and I smile to my neighbor when I see them in the morning. That means I pray for them in the evening. That means when I'm at the grocery store and the woman ahead of me is short $2, I don't hesitate to give it to her. That means when I'm in the drive-thru at Starbucks, you know, I, might be, I might buy the person's coffee behind me. This means when I'm eating out, I make sure to bless the waitress or waiter with a generous tip. See, we're just seeking ways to constantly bless others in word or deed, just in the regular, like, rhythms of everyday life. And alongside that, the fourth way we can love our neighbor is to promote grace and mercy in our community. Specifically, this means we are serving those who are most likely to be forgotten in our culture, people who are dealing maybe with material poverty or some other kind of hardship. Uh, as a church, you know, we already do several initiatives to help with those things, but we need to find uh, more ways to serve more people and involve more of us, uh, in, even in just everyday life, let alone as an like um, organization. That we have to find ways to bridge the gap between demonstrating God's love and ultimately proclaiming it as well. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus was clear about this. He says this in the parable. He says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so that's what we want to do. That by promoting grace and mercy in our community, ultimately we're serving Jesus himself. So FCC, I want us to be known as a church that steps out into the unknown and, and takes a risk for the glory of God so that the world might see that our, our God can do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. We need to stop being so safe. Stop being so careful. Uh, the problem for Christians today is that we value safety and comfort over adventure and bold living. And we have to wake up to the fact that the world is telling us to stay safe and comfortable. That when it comes to sharing our faith and loving our neighbors, how is that working out for us and the church in general? To stay safe and status quo about how we do things. Now, the church in this country thinks, for the most part, thinks that if we can just make Sunday mornings you know, bigger and better and more attractive, that people will flock to their buildings and learn to know God and discipleship will just automatically happen. And again, there's nothing wrong with, you know, larger churches and better quality worship, but that's the basket that the church in America has put most of its eggs into reaching people who don't know Christ. And how's that working out? 
Um, I used to believe that for decades, that that's the way it worked. And it doesn't, for the most part. Do you, do you think the 11 disciples of Jesus grew more when they listened to Jesus teach the crowds of people or when he spent time with them as a community? Einstein even said, you know, you, you want to know what insanity is, doing the same thing over and over and thinking you're going to get different results. So church, we're never going to do the kind of work God wants us to do in this region and see the people who aren't following Jesus come to faith in Jesus if we just keep doing the same old, same old. We need to rethink about how we step out in faith and love this world towards Jesus Christ, and it's going to look like things maybe we haven't thought of or never tried or never done. But we can't forget who we are. Hebrews 10.39, we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so we, we have yet to see what God is going to do through the ministry of this church, I believe. We have yet to see what He can do through our own lives. We have yet to see what it looks like when you step out in faith in ways you haven't done before and see God come through and empower you to walk on water. We've yet to see it. But faith says that we believe it. I mean, let me just ask you, what's the opposite of love? Hate or indifference? What's the opposite of joy? And what's the opposite of faith? It's a trick question. Yeah, normally you'd say doubt, but that's not really. It's actually sight, isn't it? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. So if you're waiting for it to make sense, you've come to the wrong place. That God is going to call you to stuff that doesn't make sense sometimes. He's going to call us out to step in faith in ways that we never thought possible because God wants us to experience the miraculous through our life as we trust Him by faith to step into what he's calling us to do. And so I want us to be a people of faith who step out into the waters of uncertainty because we know our God is bigger than our failures and able to accomplish more than we could ever ask or imagine. Habakkuk 2.14 is really God's vision uh, for the world. It says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's a vision of the future. It will happen because God said it will. Paul puts it a little differently in Philippians 2. He says, Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's that word glory again. And we believe that God gives us a picture of the future so we know how to live our lives in the present. That the future should shape our present reality. I mean, if you read the Bible and you see there's a future when all things will be made new and all things will be made right, where all wounds will be healed and all relationships will be restored and the true nature of God will be fully known and the kind of people we were always made to be will be fully realized, we will begin to live that out to the best of our ability and through the power of the Holy Spirit now. We as a people who long for that day are called to live today in light of that day. And so that means we're supposed to be the first fruit of a future reality that God would bring about in our hearts, not just the longing for that future, but a demonstration of it, breaking into the present. And so anytime we submit our lives to God, whether it's, you know, our whole life, or even if we just can submit like, the 15 minutes, you know, sometimes it works that way, right? That Jesus works out the future hope in our present reality in such a way that the world can see what God is like and what God is doing so that they might want to actually be with God. That's what's going on. The future hope is always meant to change the present behavior in all of our lives. And the church has often gotten that backwards. Because we, you know, I don't know about you, but maybe you were at a church that said, oh, you're just going to pray this prayer and you're in, right? And that's it. That's just the beginning, right? Because now you have this future hope for yourself, but you have to begin living that out in your present behavior. So we're supposed to live in such a way that the true nature of who God is and what he's doing and what we will get to enjoy someday gets to be seen today. Maybe only in a shadow version because it's not fully realized, but it's still true. 
So the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That word glory is important to understand. The glory of God is the truth of who God really is. Glory is the true nature of a thing. And so when we say the glory of God, we're saying the very reality of what God is really like. And so we're supposed to to live our lives in such a way that the true nature, the true reality of, of what God is really like gets to be both seen and heard through us. God's people. Paul says it this way in Colossians 1.27, to them, referring to those who don't yet know God, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in where? You! The hope of glory. He wants to make known to those who don't know Him the glorious riches of Christ through us, the hope of glory. Don't miss this. Paul is saying that the only way the world is going to know the truth about who God is and what he's done is not because you and I try really hard, but because Jesus Christ, who is the true glory of God in bodily form, has now by his Spirit come to make dwelling in our lives so that through our lives he might make known what God is really like, that he might fill us with the glory of God. And so the goal is that in Christ, God was fully seen, and now in Christ, you and I might be all that he made us to be, so that through us, Christ might make the Father known to others. That's what it means to be church. I don't know that we've taught that very well. That we are the indwelt people, whereby God dwells in you and in me, and through us, so that the world might see what he's really like. I love how Paul describes this in Ephesians 1. If you want to understand what the church is meant to be, here's a good picture of it. It says, it's in your insert, this is really important. God placed all things, how many things? All things under his feet, that is Christ, and appointed him to be head over how many things? Everything. For who? For the church, which is his what? The fullness of him who fills how much? So who is the head? Jesus Christ. Who is the body, the church? Where are all things under feet? Where does that put the church? Over all things in Christ. That's pretty amazing. I mean, if you aren't a Christian, God wants to bring you to a place through your relationship with Jesus who has authority over all things. And so he wants to to connect you to Jesus as the head over all things so that in Christ you might be able to go to work, Go to school, go to your sports activities, go to your neighborhood, knowing that you are walking with the authority and power of Jesus Christ who overcame everything that has destroyed the world so that you might bring Christ's renewing presence everywhere you go. That's amazing. That wherever you go, you go as part of the church, Christ's body, through which Jesus exercises his authority over all things. So when I go to work, you know, it's as if Jesus is going to work in me. My human boss isn't the ultimate boss. Jesus is the ultimate boss over my human boss. And so I go to work knowing he has authority over, you know, Sylvania or Amazon or wherever you work, you know, or any school in the county. He has authority over your neighborhood. He has authority over your wildcats. (laughs) And, And the Spartans, yes. I'm assuming that, yes. Maybe more so. Jesus is over all. Well, we need a little more help, I think. Jesus is over all. And so that means when we walk into any environment, we never walk in like a victim or that we can't bring change or hope. We get to bring the very presence and power of Jesus to every place where we work, live, learn, and play knowing that Jesus wants to be made known, that the glory of God would be seen through his people so that the world would actually go, hey, you know what? I think God loves me. God cares for us. God actually has something to say about everything in life. Amen? And so if if you're a visitor and you're not yet a Christian, you need to know that the church exists to bring the real presence of God to every place where we work, live, learn, and play so that God can be seen and known for who he is everywhere. That's who we are. That's who you are. So how do we do that? 
Well, the vision of God is, is that he would be seen and known and experienced everywhere through his church. How do we do it? Well, Jesus gives us this miss, mission in Matthew 28. He says the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Just as an aside, I think that's a really powerful phrase that Matthew uses there. Maybe because he was one of them, right? But some doubted. That's encouraging because they had been with Jesus three plus years, watching him die and rise again, and they're still struggling with doubt. You know, when I was younger, I was like, how, are they, how, could, they not, how could they doubt that stuff? And now, like I'm older, I'm like, that happens to me sometimes. Doubt is simply struggling to explain what you believe. It's not the opposite of faith. So if any of you are here doubting, there's evidence of some faith. It's evidence of you struggling with belief. It means you want to grow in your faith, but you're struggling and you have questions. And so this has to be a place, a community, where we can say, hey, it's okay to struggle with doubt. Because if the disciples who get the commission to reach the world from Jesus are struggling with doubt, it's got to be okay for us to do so as well. Verse 18, Jesus came to them and said to their doubt, all authority, sounds like that passage in Ephesians, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus. Therefore, you go out and make disciples of all nations, not just people who look like us, but you make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the mission of Jesus' disciples, the mission of Jesus' church is to make disciples of all people, all people, people with whom we live, learn, work, or play, wherever it is. We believe we are called as FCC, the people who exist for the glory of God. Our mission is to make disciples on a daily basis where we live, learn, work, and play. And so let me just be really clear about this. We don't believe that we can effectively make disciples in this room in an hour each week. You can't make disciples by looking at the backs of other people's heads. You have to look them in the face. You have to know them. You have to be doing life in, in community with them. You have to be face to face and arm in arm together in life. That's how it works. I mean, we know this is important. You know, this is important, of course. We talked about that in the first week. Sunday is essential, it's just not sufficient. But we still do it because it's necessary. So we're going to keep magnifying Jesus on Sunday morning. We're going to keep making him known through the preaching and teaching of God's word and through you know, music and worship that way. And so we do that because we want worship to shape our everyday. But I want to, I want to be clear, we can't make disciples of Jesus in isolation. We can't be disciples of Jesus in a crowd. We must be in community, on mission together with people we know and who know us, and together love Jesus and grow in our love for Jesus and how to follow him. Amen? So a disciple of Jesus has a personal relationship with Jesus, is becoming more and more like Jesus, and then is obeying the commandments of Jesus as a result. And the interesting thing about all of Jesus' commandments is that they require us doing it together. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I would rather be, I'd love to be on mission with Jesus, but just not be around other people. That's just not possible. I'm sorry. It's impossible to be in isolation, okay, to be in obedience. You have to be in community somehow with others. That's why you'll hear more about uh, joining a missional community starting this fall so that you're not alone, but you're learning how to make disciples together that you're growing in your relationship with Jesus by becoming more like Jesus who wasn't in isolation but was in community. Just think about this, though, for a minute. Think about this. If God loved you and me so much that he was willing to move heaven and earth, give his son to die for our sins, overcome sin, Satan, and death to forgive us and set us free, give us a new heart, empower us to live a new life, call us to be his sons and daughters who he really, really loves, and who will enjoy uh, heaven uh, forever with Jesus. One day, if that's true for you, do you know the love of God enough to love others enough to teach them about the love of God? 
David Platt said it this way, every saved person this side of heaven owes the gospel to every unsaved person this side of hell. We owe what we've been given so that others can receive the grace and good news about Jesus. Here's the thing I love about our Christian faith. God never calls us to do something that he hasn't already done for you and that he hasn't already done in you. He loved you through his son, and then he pours out his love into your heart, Romans 5, 5, through the Spirit. So you have love from God. You've been filled with the love of God so that you can love like God. That's how it works. It's powerful. And that's what's so remarkable about Christianity. If you put it up against any other religion, all other religions are about what you must do to be acceptable before God. And Christianity is about what God has done to make you acceptable and what God does in you to change and what God does through you to show the world what he's like. I mean, all the work's on him. We just get to rest in the presence of God and let the Spirit guide us and do his work, not because we do it for him, but because he does it in us and to us, and then through us. So how are we doing, FCC, in these three relationships? Our up, in, and out. Love God, love our neighbor, love the family. Now, over the past couple of years, I've really worked a lot more. I've been, we've been talking about some of this stuff internally for quite a while now. And so I've been working, I've got my own weaknesses and strengths myself, and I've been really, really working on the up relationships in my own life. And while I haven't seen a lot of tangible fruit in those relationships yet, I do know that I'm being more faithful. And my relationship with God and with many of you has grown quite a bit. So can you personally identify which one you are the strongest at if you're a follower of Jesus and which one you're the weakest at? We've all got our our weaker one and our stronger one. Can you figure that out as you look at the up, in, and out relationships? In this coming season of life, will you work on one or two of the weaker ones so you will be a growing, thriving disciple of Jesus? I hope so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word which challenges us to to step up to your expectations for our lives. We're so glad that we, we can't do this alone. It's not about just trying harder, Lord. It's really about depending on you, becoming closer to you, that as our relationship with you grows, we have a better understanding of the relationships that we have in this world. And so, Lord, would your spirit fill us and guide us this week that we'd find tangible ways to bless others, whether they're in our church family or just strangers or maybe acquaintances we know. Lord, would you just begin to teach us ways we can demonstrate your love through deeds and words. In Jesus' name we pray.